Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing great. I feel a bit nervous because uh, this is the first time, I guess. But everything else, all in all, I'm very happy. Also, I'm very, very happy to be starting this project we call The Wife of Caesar. Um, this is brought to you by Striner. Uh, my name is Michel Levien or Michel, either way is fine. And I'm just ecstatic to be here with you doing this. Okay, so what is The Wife of Caesar and what will we be talking about? Well, this program is Striner's attempt to talk about corruption, but to, to, to talk about it and to broach the subject in a way that's not, um, that doesn't feel rigid, uh, that's not, uh, that does not fall back on commonplaces and, or mere complaints, but also in a way in which we can approach corruption, a everyday, an everyday person can approach corruption um, with something with a little more than just good intentions. Okay, so what is Striner? Striner is a team of professionals devoted to fighting corruption. And because we believe so much in what we do, we don't want to hoard all of the information. We want to share it with the people so that you can do your part as well. Okay, so our program will be divided into generally three sections. Uh, one is for news and current events. In the second one, we will discuss a notorious case concerning corruption. And in the third section, we will discuss uh, corruption typologies. We will uh, go a little bit deeper into what a typology exactly is in a bit. Great, let's begin with news and current events. In this section, we take uh, we take news, we analyze them, and we try to connect the dots for you in, in a way that is not necessarily obvious. Sometimes the connection between the piece of news and or an article and corruption is is fairly clear. Sometimes it's not it's not so not so clear at all. Um, and our job is to try to analyze that for you and provide you with some insight. Well, we are recording on the third week of 2019, uh, which spans from the 14th to the 20th of January. And today's news is occupied immensely by the news concerning Pemex. Uh, Pemex, for those of you who don't know, is the Mexican conglomerate. It is a state-owned entity which handles gasoline and fuel distribution in, um, in Mexico and in some places in Latin America. Okay, just to give you a little bit of context. Number one, Mexico has very grave problems concerning uh, fuel theft. Uh, number two, the new president has been in office for only 50 days as of today. As of three weeks ago, the Mexican army has been posted to several facilities in Pemex. And since then, there has been a shortage of fuel in several cities of Mexico, purportedly uh, because, of the, because the government has closed off several distribution lines or distribution pipes, which allegedly were drilled and tapped illegally. Finally, the, the Mexican president himself has, uh, has made it very clear that Pemex is losing about 60 billion pesos per year. That's about 3.1 billion United States dollars. This is the loss, the accumulated loss that can be attributed to fuel theft. Now, he, he has also very clearly stated that only about 20% of that loss is due to illegally tapping the ducts or the line. So where is the rest going or, or from where is the rest coming? Separately, in New York, within the trial of Joaquin Chapo Guzman, testimony has surfaced that the supposed, the alleged leader of the Sinaloa cartel has met with several Pemex high executives uh, over the past few years. And the idea or the testimony was that the kingpin met with the executives with the idea of shipping tons of cocaine within uh, Pemex owned ships. Now, what's interesting is that this plan never, never actually came to fruition and the cocaine never entered the US, but the witness the, declared that, that Joaquin Guzman met with the Pemex exec executives several times. Now, this is an issue because generally state-owned uh, ex state entity executives don't meet with crime dr drug lords. The question bothering us at Striner is who, benefit, who can benefit from this? Now, Pemex has many employees, but how many of these employees have access to knowing exactly where these uh, fuel pipelines are located and two, having enough sway to decide how the, the company's ships are used, especially to fill them with cocaine, right? Now, this seems like a very open-ended and easy question, but the list cannot be very long. How many employees have this kind of power? So it wouldn't also be it, it also wouldn't be difficult to obtain uh, for you know say an anti-corruption prosecutor who by the way has yet to be appointed here in Mexico to obtain that information. Now, from someone in that office, it, it would also be fairly easy to obtain a list from the public registers of the of the government concerning uh, you know real property, concerning vehicles, uh, other types of property, and to try to compare and contrast the list with any items that might seem odd or too expensive. Likewise, our imaginary attorney would have access to commercial registers 
either official or unofficial. When I say unofficial, I mean things like the Panama Papers, and she would be able to contrast the original list with the names of, of uh, people appearing on those papers or on those registers. The, the point of this being to know which employee is connected to which company. In the very same way, it must not be very complicated for, for a savvy attorney, like our imaginary attorney, to contact the Financial Intelligence, Intelligence Unit. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Financial Intelligence Unit basically monitors financial information, monetary transactions, uh, and keep, keeps a lookout for money laundering and suspicious activities. That is a very broad description of what they do. And it is a part of the government. Now, a skilled attorney could liaise with uh, the financial intelligence unit and again, compare the list that she has from the Pemex employee, oh, sorry, of the Pemex employees to a, a list of any suspicious activities concerning money laundering. Even simpler it must be for such an attorney to get a court order to require that banks, department stores, airlines, country clubs, and luxury goods stores turn over a list of their clients. Now this would all be privileged, but it would also be protected because it's been handed through a court order and to an authority. Comparing and contrasting those lists, the attorney or you know the government would have an idea of who is spending what. That's, that is, this is an easy idea or a few easy ideas of how relatively simple or clear it would be to conduct an investigation. And this might be, or might seem a little speculative, but these could create leads, you know, indicia. Indicia of impropriety leads to investigations, which investigations lead generally to prosecution. Prosecution leads to trial, and trial sometimes maybe leads to the administration of justice. So it wouldn't be as hard to do something like that. Again, this is our uh, little bit of speculation. Now, the whole point of, it, of this is that a company like Pemex would not even be in a situation like this if they had proper compliance programs and proper policy in place and if people adhere to it. The, the issue here is that Pemex is notoriously, notoriously famous for not having proper compliance. All right, so let's move on to our case. Today, it's Panasonic. Um, in April 2018, Panasonic was forced to pay a fine of $280 million to the DOJ and to the SEC for paying bribes in several, in several countries. The countries themselves were not disclosed. The, um, the actual documents from the DOJ only state it, it was, they were Middle Eastern countries and Asian countries. Apparently from 2007 to 2013, the Japanese company and one of its subsidiaries began uh, offering a public official a job uh, that would pay uh, a yearly salary of $875,000 in exchange for performing independent consulting functions. Now, these functions were really perfunctory. Uh, the, the, op the official would have to do nothing or very, very close to nothing in exchange for that money. Now, this official happened to be the person in charge of a tender uh, held by a government-owned airline. In this particular case, the offer was made, the official accepted, and he was paid the, the money and the airline actually bought and installed the Panasonic devices. These were entertaining devices, so thankfully it wasn't anything that put anyone's lives at risk. Following a very extensive uh, investigation by the DOJ and the SEC, they were, they were able to figure out that Panasonic not only engaged in this conduct, but they also did the same thing for two other countries and for two other officials. Only in this case, they paid them a little more. They paid the, they paid the, the other two officials $900,000 uh, per year. Uh, again, same results. They obtained the business through the bribery. The, the important part of this is that, uh, well, Panasonic was sanctioned. The fine is considerable. It's not the, the highest one in history. Uh, obviously, Siemens, Telia, those uh, Odebrecht have been bigger, but it is a, a relatively large fine. The important part here is that this, number one, this would not have happened if proper compliance programs were put in place or respected by, by the high officials at Panasonic. And number two, more interesting, this is very indicative of a trend that's been developing lately. It used to be that only the authorities would only prosecute uh, natural persons, that is, you and me, individuals, human beings. Now, after some time, they began prosecuting actual companies, firms, uh, and they became very much the focus of the authorities. But as of maybe two years and on, the authorities have been focused in prosecuting both the company and the person who is actually physically responsible for the bribery. This is important because 
it is a, a measure implemented to dissuade those people who are actually doing the bribery from from incurring it. And again, this is the sort of thing that would not happen if proper compliance uh, protocols and programs were put in place. Finally, let's move on to the typology section. First of all, what is a typology? Well, it's any model or any example of a given phenomenon. In the case of corruption, another way to understand uh, uh, typologies is to think of them as you know, knowing the tricks, knowing the, in and, the ins and outs of how to corrupt or commit corrupt acts. Now, today, the, our typology deals with bribery. Well, first, corruption is not the same as bribery in general. We need to make clear that corruption in general is the abuse of elected office for, for private gain. On the other hand, bribery is the improper offer promise or actual giving of something of value in exchange for a service and to a public official. So in a way, if it helps, you can you can think of corruption as being broader. So all corruption, sorry, all bribery is corruption, but not all corruption is bribery, if that makes any sense. Okay, so today's typology deals with paying bribes and disguising them as proper payments made to vendors or, or to subcontractors. Okay, in the simplest form of this type of bribery, the person paying the bribe does not give it directly to the public official. Rather, he or she or it does it through someone else. The someone else generally uh, comes from finding or even fabricating a reason to hire a person that is related to the public official. That means that you as a public official would not get the money, but your brother might, your sister, your cousin, someone related or close to you. I'll give you a, an even better example. For example, I own a company that sells insurance and I want the local government to buy policies for all of its staff. Now, I cannot pay a bribe directly to the person who was in charge of the tender because that is too risky. So what I do is, let's say that this, this official has a sister who is a certified public accountant. Well, I find that sister and I explain to her that, and obviously to the public official, that my company will hire the CPA or the CPA's firm uh, for, you know, handling the accounting of my business in exchange, of course, for the local government giving me their business. If they accept, then that's a form of bribery. Now, this type of typology might seem very clear in the hypotheticals, but in reality, it's, it's very hard to detect because there might be very legitimate reasons for, for which one firm hires another one. So th th in this situation, um, Conflict interest policies play a large role, also uh, conflict of interest declarations. Because if a company has in place a policy that requires its employees to divulge with whom they do business and with whom they are related, it's much easier to detect this sort of thing. Well, that's it for today. I, if you enjoyed yourself, uh, please look out for our upcoming videos, or if you want to make your life easier, you might as well just subscribe. Just a suggestion. If you have any doubts about any topic concerning corruption, or you have a piece of news, or you have an article or a case that you wish us to discuss, please, you can find us on social media. Please let us know. Uh, we would love to, def we definitely would love to hear from you. Finally, a small reminder of something that's very, very important. Now, corruption should be reported. Yes, in general, yes. But you should only report corruption if you come across it in your day-to-day -day life, if you feel absolutely safe, if you feel absolutely secure. If you do not, for however, for whatever reason, feel free to contact us to write it to info at striner.mx and let us know. Maybe you need information, maybe you need a recommendation, maybe you actually need for us to help you directly and we will help you in any way we can. Again, my name is Michel Levien. This thing we're doing is called The Wife of Caesar and I very much enjoy being with you today. Thank you.